Okay, well, good morning. As you know, we're still in Romans 13. We're probably going to be here for one more week. And uh, just want to... Um just want to keep encouraging you. I, I know this study on Christian and politics has kind of been an eye-opener, a shock maybe to some of us, and that's okay. Um, it's okay. I know there's still a lot of questions, and we're going to get to those questions, and my intent was to really hammer out some of those questions this week, but I'm going to be quite honest with you. I was confronted with a scriptural, a, a theological premise framework that I had really never considered before this week. This has been a really hard week for me to write this sermon. I'm just going to say that up front because I had to start from scratch uh, on a, a, a theological framework that I have not given thought uh, necessary. And even as we've talked about the, 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 the Christian and politics over the past couple weeks, it didn't even hit me till this week. Uh, one of our major problems as a country, one of the major issues as a country, one of the major issues we have in the, the complete moral decay, the complete decay of this society, is attributed what, to attributed attributed biblically biblically to what we're going to discuss this morning. And so, I just want to say up front that. Uh, I did my very best to, to get through this and put this in a, in a, in a format that's understandable. Um, we're using a lot of scripture here. We're going to be looking at the Old Testament quite a bit this morning. And I also want to warn you that there's a principle here that might be very shocking. And I'm saying to say probably it will be very shocking to every one of us. It's just going to be. I don't mean to offend. As you know, I never do. That's not my point. My point is to bring truth to us so we can understand really why we're at where we're at as a country. Now, many people say, well, the reason we're at, we're at as a country is because Christians haven't been in politics enough. And I disagree with that completely. I think Christians have been in politics too much. And we haven't done our call. We haven't done what we've been called to do as Christians. That's number one. But number two, there's another principle at work that we can change all the laws we want to. We can do all the things we want to. We can even preach the gospel as much as we want to, but there is already a judgment upon this nation. And we're going to look at why that is this morning. There's already a judgment of God upon this nation. Now, it doesn't mean that souls can't be saved and the kingdom of God won't be built. Of course, the kingdom of God can and will be built through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want to just kind of give you a, a, a dire, uh, a dire. I don't even know if it's, if it's a warning, just a dire reality. Uh, I believe this, that our time as a nation is, is up. It's short, so to speak. I don't know when that will be. We might survive another 50 years, another 200 years. I don't know. But the writing's already on the wall. And the writing is on the wall because history always repeats itself, always repeats itself. And where we're at as a country is the same place that every country before us have, has gotten to, has gotten to a point where they're at this point where morality, the moral slide of the country is so far gone that it inevitably collapse is going to come at some point. And it doesn't come usually from uh, Russia dropping nukes on us. It's going to come from within. We have destroyed ourselves. And there's a principle that the government has not upholded, that has not upheld, I should say, that has really set these things in motion. We're going to look at that this morning because what we're going to discuss today is not what I had at all in my outline, okay? I'm going to be very honest. I didn't have, this, this sermon series, or this sermon this, this morning uh, took a quite, uh, quite a sharp turn uh, over Friday and Saturday as I began to discuss, and, and I, I was ill-equipped to deal with this, and so I relied heavily upon uh, biblical scholars and, uh, and study Bibles that I've had for a long time that I've just, it's kind of funny. Isn't it amazing how you just see things for the first time? I can't tell you how many times I've read this passage. I can't tell you how many times I've read through the entire Bible and have never connected these dots before until finally the theological framework was introduced uh, through my favorite b uh, biblical commentator, that's Matthew Henry, and then I had to really get busy and be like, okay, what does this mean? What does this mean? So like I said, I also want to just warn you, even though what we're going to discuss this morning is a very biblical, sound theological principle, it's going to seem pretty cruel. And it's going to be hard to wrap our minds around, perhaps, at first. So be very uh, careful as uh, to listen this morning. Um, but I think it needs to be discussed. And I think it needs to be discussed in detail because one of the fundamental reasons that America is in the situation it is is because we violated an often overlooked and yet very important structure in governments that God has laid the foundation to from the very beginning. Now, I'm not trying to be all over the place this morning, and trust me, what we're going to talk about today is going to be directly related to the answering some of those questions you have about, okay, what, are, what, what can we do then as our role in government? What, what, what's okay? What's, what does the Bible give us prescription to do? How do we interact within the government we live in? Because we're not supposed to be of the world. We're in this world. We're not of it. We're of a kingdom, but we also have civil responsibilities. There's no question. And so we need to define those things. But trust me, this will work its way into that next week. 
What I'm trying to get us to understand is that we in American, just Americans in general, Christian Americans, we need a priority reset. And that's really what we've been talking about from the beginning of Romans chapter 12. Okay, we need to kind of strip everything back. We need to strip everything we think we know about service to God, and we need to reset our priorities. We need to reset them. And it starts with living as as living sacrifices to the Lord. Once we do that, once we humble ourselves before the God, then he can begin to teach us and fill in those blanks, so to speak, and teach us exactly how to walk with him. Because we don't get to make the decision. Next week, we're going to talk about really why being in a democracy has hampered our growth as Christians. Because we think everything is debatable. We think everything is a check and balance. There should be, a, there should be multiple ways around something. There should be open, robust debate about everything. And we apply that to the scriptures. And I think we apply that to the scriptures without even realizing it. God's kingdom is not a democracy, church. It's not. It's an absolute theocracy, authoritative, I don't don't want to use the word dictatorship because it has a negative connotation, but it's an authoritative theocracy. There is one God and he is in control of all things. There is no democracy in Christianity, none whatsoever. And living in a democracy has really hampered our ability to understand kingdom principles. We want to argue everything. We want to debate everything. We want to do things our way because that's what we've been trained to do in this culture. Everything is open to debate. We're going to get into that next week a little bit more. And I I just kind of... I kind of digressed a little bit there. But I'll get back on track. Brothers and sisters, I I just want us to understand that a priority reset is what we need. Because everything in our lives, even government, even how we interact politically, is downstream from that very important thing. That very important thing. If we live as kingdom people, then our lives will change downstream of that, everything. I don't care if it's politics, how you raise your family, wives, how you respond to your husbands, husbands, how you respond to your wives, children, how you respond to your parents. Everything is downstream of that. And I think we needed a priority reset. We have been so blindsided by distractions that I think it's hard for us to truly understand kingdom living. That's where we're going. But until we get there next week, we've got to discuss this principle from this morning. We need to start living like we understand we're citizens of God's kingdom primarily. Primarily. Okay, so let's look back at Romans 13, 1 through 7. Okay? 13, 1 through 7. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. This is what we're getting to today, starting in verse 3. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have the fear? Do you want to have no fear of authority? Then do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God for your good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of your because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay your taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So that's what we're dealing with today. And actually, particularly, particularly we're going to be looking at verses 3 and 4. Um, but remember, there's two major points. There's two major things as Christians here that we need to look at, that we've been given an, a responsibility. Two things. We looked at the, the first one last week. Pretty simple, although it took me a long time to explain it. Be in subjection to the authorities. As Christians, we all have authorities in our life, every one of us. And as Christian men and women, we have an authority over us in this country. It's our government. We need to be in subjection to that. Now, I spent a lot of time there that last week. We're not going to go uh, any further there. But the other thing that we're told is to pay your taxes. Or really, the, the broader theme is to, to, to give what is owed. Give what is owed. Now, taxes are one of those things. And I don't want to spend a lot of time here, which we probably could. We could probably spend a ton of time talking about taxes, and maybe we will in two weeks or three weeks. I don't even know. But I just want to get this out of the way for now so we can get to the main meat of what I want to talk about this morning. And, and this is going to be my shortest teaching ever. And it's very simple. Church, pay your taxes. Okay? Just do it. Just pay them. Okay? You owe it to the government. Don't do it because you're afraid to go to jail. Do it because you actually owe it. It is owed. We don't complain about it. We do it. Now, Jesus was asked this question, and Jesus said, just give to Caesar what belongs to him. 
What does it matter? It's money. There's kingdom stuff to do. Give to God what belongs to him, which is your whole life, which is kingdom work. Forget about the money. Give to, now, give to Caesar whatever he wants. And Caesar's taxes were way more unfair than ours, by the way. Give to it. So there's, there's your teaching on that. Just pay your taxes, period. Everyone good there? No objections? Okay, we'll move on. Okay, so we've been looking at this Christian response to government over the past two weeks. But this morning, I want to push forward and look at the government's response, responsibility to the Christian, or not even to the Christian, to society. What is the government's responsibility to society? Because it's talked about here as well. We have a responsibility to the government, but the government actually has a responsibility to us as people that live within this government. What is it? What is it? Now, in this country, we say, well, the government's uh, responsibility to us is freedom. Okay, that doesn't say that anywhere in the scriptures. Nowhere, by the way. It's freedom within a government is, no, is not a right. It's not a God-given right. You hear that all the time. My God-given right is freedom. No, it's not. It's nowhere in the scriptures. Actually, democracy didn't even exist. It, it didn't even exist anywhere in human history up until the beginnings, at the signing of the Magna Carta, which was maybe six or seven, about 700 years ago. And that was, that was the beginning of democracy. There's no such thing as democracy in the writing of the scriptures at this time. Government doesn't owe us any type of freedom. It owes us actually specifically one thing, and we're going to look at that this morning. But we're getting a clearer picture on our role in government, but, but what is government's role to us? What is their responsibility? Let's look at it real quick. It's verses uh, 3 and 4. This is the main responsibility that our government has for us. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Then do what is good, and you will have praise from them. For it, that's the government, is a minister of God for your good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. There, by the way, is the government's main concern, their main authority given to them by God, the main thing that they're called to do in a society. It's to bear the sword. Now, we're going to look at that and what that means exactly in a moment. It's pretty straightforward. The government's role and responsibility is to protect life and to protect your livelihood. How they do that in the, in, the, in the form of government they do that in, by the way, we'll talk about China a little bit, they do a whole lot better job of this than Americans do, than the American government. A whole lot better job of upholding justice than the American criminal justice system does. And that's the role of the government, to uphold justice. Individually, we all want justice, right? Every one of us want justice. We want people to pay for their crimes, their crimes against God, their crimes against humanity, their crime against their country. We want to see that. We love justice. And yet we can't take matters into our own hands. That's not given to us as Christians. It's given to our governing authorities. Vengeance, vengeance isn't ours. It's God's. Now, this is so important. Think about what Paul writes exactly before this in Romans 12. Paul writes something in Romans 12, then he leads into Romans 13. And what does he write in Romans 12, 14 through 21? I hope you can read that. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. That's what we're supposed to do. Never take revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. In doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, these verses come directly before Romans 13, where Paul starts talking about the government and the government bearing the sword. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. He tells us that one of the ways in which God avenges and brings justice is through the sword of the government. The government. I think when we read about the vengeance of God, like in Romans 12, we often think of eternal vengeance. Eternal vengeance. God is going to one day pour his wrath out on all those who deserve it for their rejection of the gospel, for their rejection of Jesus Christ. And God will, God will bring vengeance then. But that's not what this is talking about. There is vengeance on earth that God also brings. And he uses the sword of the government in order to do that. Vengeance belongs to God, and God gave vengeance to the government, to the governing authorities. 
This is not primarily talking about eternal vengeance. This is primarily talking about the government's role to bring vengeance upon evildoers. God has an avenue to bring vengeance to the earth now, and the world's governments are the way of, that God administers that vengeance on evildoers. Look at this. I'll read it again. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it, the government, does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Now, this is a strong warning. If you do what is evil, if you do what is against the law, you ought to be terrified. You ought to be terrified. The government carries the sword on behalf of God. And brothers and sisters, what do you do with a sword? You execute. You don't administer, bail, uh, uh, you don't administer no, no, or zero bail policies with a sword, which is what we do right now. You don't administer fines with a sword. You don't even administer jail time with a sword. A sword is for one thing. You execute people with a sword. What he's saying here is that the government has the right, and not only the right, but the actual duty as a minister of God to bring capital punishment. It is the absolute duty and right of the government. It's not negotiable, and we'll look at why it's not negotiable in a minute. minute. Civil government is not just to take up a position or to build buildings down at the courthouse or to have government agencies doing various things. Primarily, it's for vengeance. It's for the sword. It's not to build parks and build roads, although it does that too, but that's not its primary objective. Its bi primary objective is to bear the sword. And I need to make a point right up, here, right up front here. Civil government is not given by God. Listen, and I'm going to qualify this. It is not given uh, authority by God to use that authority for mercy. It has no right to mercy. It has a right and a duty to bear the sword. Brothers and sisters, the gospel is for mercy. The government is for vengeance. The government isn't given a sword and given responsibility so that it can lessen the punishment to those who break the law, to let people off the hook. If you've ever questioned if the death penalty is biblical, this verse should actually, from Romans 13, should end that questioning, but there's a whole lot more. It is biblical. It is actually the duty and the necessity of government to uphold it. The sword is a symbol of death. And God's standard in dealing with murder, bloodshed, and violent crime is death. It's death. It was instituted from the very beginning. Genesis 9-6. Whoever sheds a man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Period. For in the image of God, he made man. What in the world is Moses writing here? This is what he's saying. Man is so sacred, is so beautiful to God, is so amazing to God. He's made in the very image of God that if you take the life of another human being, the only way to atone for that absolute defilement of God's beauty in, in creation is that you pay for it with your blood. It's the only way to atone it. Man is sacred, because he's made in the image of God. And governments are to atone the blood of murderers without pity, without partiality, without delay, and without mercy. That's the role of the government. Now, that might sound heavy-handed. Trust me, it's not. You'll see why in a moment. Now, the early church understand this, understood this principle very well. It readily accepted the Roman government's role in executions. The early church understood that. They understood that to commit bloody, violent crimes against people and against the government was to open yourself up to very, very dire consequences. Uh, there's many examples, but I want to look at what Paul says in Acts 25, 11, because we don't have time to look at everything. Luke writes this about Paul. Now, remember, Paul is here, he's, he's, he's appealing, he's talking to Festus, and he's going to appeal to Caesar here, because he's been accused of some crimes that he didn't actually commit, so he wants to appeal and to go through all the, the, the court systems to, to, to not have to face this penalty for crimes he didn't commit. But listen to what Paul says. He says, if then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, then I don't refuse to die. 
He's saying, listen, I know government, you've been given the sword to put wrongdoers to death. I accept that, I know that. And if I've done anything wrong that deserves of death, then you should put me to death. I get it, I understand it. And, he's, and, and he goes on, he says, I do not refuse to die, but if none of the thing, those things is true, which, with, which these men accuse me of, no one can hand me over to them, and I'll appeal to Caesar. Look, if I've committed a crime, Paul says, that's worthy of death, then I ought to die. Now, why did Paul say that? He said that because he knows God's standard. He understands it. He understands the role of government. He understands that, that, that execution of criminals is a primary function of the government, that it's God-ordained. And Paul affirms the right of government to take his life if he's violated the law. We talked about that a little bit last week. Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said the same thing. Listen, if we've done anything against you, king, we get it. You should put us to death. We understand that. That's the role of government. Now, in the Old Testament books of Numbers and Deuteronomy, God tells the, gives the Jews, and this is so important, the framework for a perfect government. If you want a perfect government, don't go to the United States Constitution. That's not a perfect government. Go to Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It gives you the only perfect form of government. It gives you the form of a government that actually will be in, implemented in the Millennium Kingdom. Okay? Theocracy. God's in charge. Period. End of story. And God gives the nation of Israel the framework for that perfect government and what it looks like. And here, in Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, the Lord prescribes death, the death penalty for several things. Murder, striking your parent, blasphemy against God, witchcraft, occult practices, if you give a false prophecy, rape, homosexuality, kidnapping, idolatry. God has ordained that government has the right to take a life if you practice these things. And in a perfect, righteous, and just government, the death penalty is carried out swiftly and without pity. Swiftly and without pity. Our text says that the government is the minister of God. And listen, part of the ministry of God in government for the good of man is to make evildoers pay with the sword. Now this is very important. Taking the life of a murderer or a rapist, these sorts of things, it's the duty of the government to do this, and the Bible says it's a matter of vengeance. Vengeance. Well, vengeance against who? who, who who's the government avenging? He's avenging God, number one. He's avenging God for, for one man killing another man who's made in the image of God. Do you ever realize that, that that's what murder is? You are literally putting a sword to the image of God. You're saying, I hate God so much, I'm going to kill the image of him. I'm going to kill the image of him, which is man. That's what murder is. But the avenging is also avenging the victim and avenging society on behalf of that victim. So there's avenging that needs to take place. Avenge, you know, vengeance, but I say avenging this morning because it's the same word. And there's a very popular movie franchise out right now called The Avengers. I've only seen one of the movies. I had to fill about 16 hours of flight time on the way back from Egypt, and so I, I watched one of the Avengers movies. Um... I don't know if you've seen these Avenger movies, but it's the, the premise is these superheroes that fly around, I don't know, the world or maybe the galaxy, and they avenge evil doing. They avenge evil doing. They make evildoers pay for the crimes they've committed. And of course, whenever that happens in a movie, whether it's the Avengers or anything, we're satisfied, aren't we? We're like, okay, good. That brings satisfaction to me because the evildoer got justice. They got vengeance. Vengeance. And we're satisfied. We know vengeance is right. Well, the government's duty to society to protect people and their livelihoods is by avenging wrongdoing. And they do this by using the sword very specifically to bring about that justice, to bring about that vengeance. But we often see a problem. We see it in this country. It's, 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 we don't even look at it as a problem anymore, which is part of the problem. This isn't new, but when humans make laws that bring about any other form of vengeance and punishment or justice that is anything other than blood for blood, it's not justice. It's actually injustice. And it leads to more murder and rape in every crime. Every single crime. It leads to more and more lawlessness. You do not mess with the, with the, with the laws of the universe, God's laws of the universe, and come away unscathed. Period. You don't. Every nation that ever has crumbles. And we're not the only one, and we won't be the last. 
Basically, what this is saying is you cannot take swift, impartial, capital punishment out of a society and expect that society to survive. It won't. It will not survive. It will crumble without proper justice. God has ordained government to bear the sword. And vengeance belongs to God. And on this side of eternity, he has given the sword of vengeance to the government. It is literally a hand extended of God. The government is supposed to be the hand of God extended to bring vengeance. Now listen, none of us are particularly fond of someone losing their life. I understand that. But this is not an idea up to uh, psychological or sociological debate. This is not a command that's up for moral debate. If you think it's immoral to put a murderer to death, actually you're the one who's immoral because it's right and it's just to put a murderer to death. This command of God, again, is not democratic. Capital punishment is righteous. It is just. It is moral. God declared it to be so and gave the government the sword to do it. And in this country, if we want to see less and less people die and less and less people murdered and raped and any other serious, heinous crime, the way to stop it is very clear. You take the life of the person that takes the life. You shed blood for blood. If you commit a crime against mankind, a blood crime against mankind, you will pay for it with your life. Now, I'll tell you what, that, will protect, that would protect sanctity of life pretty quick, wouldn't it? It would preserve life very quick. Now, when a nation revokes this God-given responsibility, when they do away with the sword as retribution, as vengeance for heinous crimes, then something very dangerous happens. Very dangerous. The nation becomes guilty of what the Bible and biblical scholars call blood guiltness. Actually, blood guiltness is in the Old Testament. Specifically, you find it in the Pentateuch. This idea of blood guiltness. Now, this is the theological framework we have to build this understanding around. Blood guiltness. What in the world is blood guiltness? Now, uh, sometimes I go to my Holman Bible Dictionary, and uh, I, I thought they had a pretty good definition of this. When the, murder, when the murderer was known in the community, the community then shared the guilt of that murderer until the guilty party had paid for the penalty with death. No other penalty will sacrifice or could substitute for the death of the guilty party, nor was there any need for further retribution once the murderer had been brought to justice, put to death. Did you hear what that says? If we are a community of people that are harboring murderers, then we are just as guilty of murder as they are. And the only way that murder can be atoned is if that person is brought to capital punishment, put to death. Now, this is an important concept and one that will help us make a lot of sense of the current situations in the United States of America right now. Some people think that the reason that the U.S. is in such a bad shape spiritually is because Christians haven't been uh, involved enough in politics. Now, that's not true. Christians, I think, are overly involved in politics. Overly. But the problem is actually twofold. Number one, I think we, don't, we haven't been engaged in the gospel, the kingdom building, nearly enough. That's number one. But number two, our entire society has guilty blood on our hands. Our entire society has guilty blood on our hands. The blood of unavenged, unavenged victims. We are harboring the guilty and preventing vengeance and preventing justice. That's what we're doing in this society. The reason we are lost in a sea of murder, rape, violent crime, abortion, homosexuality, it's not that we don't have laws against these things or haven't had laws against these things. The problem is our government does not avenge them. That's the problem. The government is guilty of unavenged crimes. And you guess what, brothers and sisters? Those of us living in this society are also guilty. Also guilty. And sadly, there are many Christians, and this, is, this was sad as I did my research to, to look at the death penalty. And why was the death penalty done away with? And why is it such a ridiculous, ridiculous process? Some people are on death row for 30 and 40 years. It's actually Christians that were on the front lines to do away with the death penalty. So you want to talk about a lack of biblical understanding that literally brought about laws that destroyed the very moral makeup of our nation. Much, much of it was because of Christians who thought we should give mercy instead of obeying the Lord and giving vengeance. The Bible tells us something much different than mercy when it comes to evildoers. 
The Bible says, let Jesus Christ and the gospel take care of mercy. Government, you take care of my vengeance on earth. You are my arm of vengeance for the evildoer. Can a murderer be forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters? Absolutely. There is no question. And what does that change primarily? Their eternity. Their eternity. But the government must take care of the consequences of breaking laws. They must. They must. Just because you are saved doesn't mean there are consequences to sin. Do you understand that? So listen very carefully over the next few minutes because this is where it's going to be probably tough to swallow a little bit and a little shocking and that's, what well, we have to come to this understanding. We have to come to this conclusion because the Bible teaches it very plainly and will help us make sense of why this nation is in such a free fall and such a mess. It's not, the pri it's not the only reason but it's a very primary reason. Genesis 4, 9 and 11. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is, your, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Now when Cain killed Abel, Abel's blood, the Bible says, cried out to God. It was a life taken, and listen, no life was given in retribution, in repayment for that blood. And so that blood cried out to God, unavenged blood cried out to God. Now, we don't have time to cover all the instances and the instances in the scriptures that affirm this. There are many, many, but I want to look at Levit Leviticus chapter 20. We're not going to turn here. Uh, I just want to, when you get to Levit Leviticus chapter 20, you get into a section that's all these different crimes, all these different crimes that you can commit. And after each one of these crimes, you hear this phrase, his blood shall be on him. You commit this crime, there's a penalty. It's your own blood. And it would be your fault. The government can put you to death and it's your fault that they put you to death. It's, there's no guilt on the government for doing this. In other words, his punishment is his own fault. God will not hold the person who brings about God's vengeance. He won't hold him guilty. The guilty, the guilty criminal is accountable for their own death. That's the whole understanding of Leviticus, Leviticus 20. So the pattern is the same way throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament. The Apostle Paul affirms the death, that the death penalty in the hand of the government is, right, is righteous, it is just. That blood is required for the shedding of blood. And so, church, the death penalty is not only biblical, it's actually the only prescription that the Bible gives to properly deal with certain moral and violent crimes in a nation. There's only one way to deal with it. Only one way. Now, there is more to be said on how you deal with lesser crimes, like theft, lying, drug possession, you know, those extortions, those sorts of things. But I'll tell you what, even the Old Testament, they don't ever talk about jail. It talks about retribution. You steal something from somebody, you get beat in the square, and then you pay that back. That is justice. That's justice. Throwing somebody in jail is not justice. And we're going to talk about how unjust jail is in a moment. Unjust jail is. Retribution is the idea of the perfect biblical government. You take something, you pay the same thing back. And it's not just Old Testament. Don't convince yourself that's just an Old Testament law that went, fell away with the coming of Jesus Christ. Absolutely not. It's affirmed in the New Testament as well. Retribution. You pay it back. That's the only way you deal with crime. Now we look at the current climate in the United States of America. Violent crimes, by the way, are through the roof. I forget all the statistics, but murder and carjacking and some of those things, they're up 400 and 500 percent in the past year in many major cities. Rapes, bloody assaults, you name it. And, and, and what's the world's answer to this problem? What's the United States' answer to this problem, church? It's this new unbiblical phrase we hear all the time called social justice. That's their answer. What is social justice? It's the phrase that simply means you don't punish criminals. That's literally what it means. You just don't punish them. They'll get better on their own. If you don't punish them, they'll just get better. That's why we have zero bail laws. Zero bail. You murder somebody or do some other violent crime, the judge can actually have a zero bail law. Well, they say, oh, you can just go free. And you'll have a, a, a trial date maybe three years from now. Zero bail. 
It's led to cancellation of the death penalty. It's led to these ideas of defunding the police. You just don't hold criminals accountable and they'll get better on their own. Social justice, by the way, is just, it's just injustice. That's what it is. Because it's what man wants. We want in our hearts to get away with whatever we want to get away with. And so anytime you hear the word social justice, I actually, all it is, is it's, it's code word for let criminals be criminals. Especially if they're of, their, they're of a certain skin tone. Then definitely let them be a criminal. And we see that throughout our country right now. But listen, even the ones that do get justice, okay? The ones that do get justice. What does justice even look like in this country? How many times have we seen a murderer get sentenced to life in prison and we hear things like, oh, justice was served? Baloney. Justice was not served. Not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. Jail does not serve justice. Actually, it's one of the most unjust systems in the history of the world. Long-term incarceration. It's been said very recently that uh, through, mostly from, mainly from the progressive left, which, by the way, want to run as far away from God as possible and make laws as far away from God's law as possible, which is why you see the laws they're enacting. But they'll say this, that jail is unjust and that there's an incarceration, there's an over-incarceration problem in this country. Now, listen, I agree with both of those statements wholeheartedly, but not for the reasons they do. Not for the reasons they do. I think jail is unjust. Completely unjust. What is jail? You force taxpayers to pay fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year every year for the rest of some of these people's lives so that they can work out every day and get three meals, three meals a day and a roof over their head and learn job skills and go to school and watch TV and play video games. And literally, we pay for it. Talk about unjust. Unjust. Not only this, but criminals are thrown in jail, and who are they surrounded with? The worst people in society. And what do they learn? How to be better criminals. That's what they learn when they're in jail. They learn how to, be, how to get away with it next time. They learn drug use. They learn very quickly how to sodomize each other. Jail is completely unjust to the very, very core. And all it does is it teaches criminals how to be more depraved, so when they get out, they will commit crimes again, and they do nearly every time because we have an unjust, unjust system. Jail is not a biblical prescription for justice. You don't see jail listed anywhere in the Levit Levitical law. So we do have an over-incarceration problem. We have an injustice problem. I think one person in jail long-term is over-incarceration. Even one. I'm not saying you can't have a holding cell to figure things out, figure the punishment out for a couple of days. What I'm saying is long-term jail, prison, is completely unjust for those reasons. It's unjust to us as taxpayers. It's unjust to the criminal themselves who just learn how to be more and better criminals, to learn how to sodomize one another, to learn how to be more depraved. And so what we're seeing in society today is that there's no justice, none. There is very little justice. Even those who are put to death for their crimes... It's 40 years down the road, 30 years, 20 years down the road. We need to come to the grips with something. There is no justice in this society. Not biblical justice, not actual real justice. None. Literally none. And so, this nation has a very, very big problem. We're blood guilty. That's the problem this nation has. Blood guilty. We literally have the blood of millions and millions and millions and millions of murders crying out from the ground to God unavenged, unpaid for, no justice. And you know what? Our government is mocking God's requirement of blood for blood and letting these criminals and rapists go without vengeance, without retribution. So what happens to a nation when they replace God's justice with social justice? That's a good question. What happens? Well, Israel did it. Israel did it. Let's look at Ezekiel 7, 20 through 27. They transformed the beauty of his ornaments into pride. This is talking about the nation of Israel. And they made things of their abominations and their detestable things with it. Therefore, I will make 
it an abhorrent thing to them. I will give Israel everything they have. I will give it to the hands of foreigners as plunder and the wicked of the earth as spoil and they will profane it. I will also turn my face from them, from Israel, and they will, prof and they will profane my secret place. Then robbers will enter and profane it. Make the chain for the land is full of bloody crimes and the city is full of violence. Therefore, I will bring the worst of the nations and they will possess their houses. I will also make the pride of the strong one cease and the holy places will be profaned. When anguish comes, they will seek peace, but there will be none. Disaster will come upon disaster. Rumor will be added to rumor. Then they will seek a vision from a prophet, but the law will be lost from the priests and the council from the elders. The king will mourn. The prince will be clothed with horror. The hands of the people of the land will tremble. According to their conduct, I will deal with them. And by their judgments, I will judge them. And they will know that I am the Lord. That's what happens. Now, this was right before Babylonian captivity. God held true to his word. One of the reasons, and a primary reason, that God brought judgment to the nation of Israel in Babylonian captivity was because the nation was full of immoral, violent, bloody crimes that went unavenged. Their cities were full of bloody, violent crimes. Rapes, murders, immorality, for which there was no retribution. They let it go. They let it go. And blood was crying out to God for vengeance. And God answered that cry. And Israel was destroyed and wasn't restored as a nation for 2,500 years after this moment. 2,500 years. And this is God's chosen people. And they paid for this for 2,500 years. And I don't have to remind you of the horrors that the Jewish nation has faced in those 2,500 years. It was repayment for this. Repayment for this. Now, is it really all that surprising, church, that a city or a nation that doesn't deal with violent murders, blood, crimes, rapes and those sorts of things with justice and swift vengeance that it en ends up being full of violent criminals? Is it any wonder that that happens? It's obvious that if you don't punish criminals, you will embolden them and that city will be in full of violence and it's happening right now. And that was exactly what Ezekiel saw. In other words, God brought terrible judgment upon Israel because of the unpaid blood guiltness of the nation. Now, why does God require blood for blood? Does God hate people? Is that what he's doing? I just hate people so much. I just want, I think everybody should die. Of course not. No, God loves and cares for people and that's exactly, precisely why he requires blood for blood. Because he loves us and cares for us. He knows that when blood is shed to deal with a criminal, they're executed swiftly, justly, and without mercy. This becomes a terror and a deterrent to criminals. He knows that. Christians have the Holy Spirit, right? Why don't we go around murdering people and doing violent crimes? Because we have the Holy Spirit to restrain us, but the world doesn't. They need the hand of God administered by the government to be their deterrent. They need the hand of the government to act on behalf of the Holy Spirit of restraint for the people, the wicked people of the earth. They have to have it. Because men at their core, contrary to popular belief, are the most vile, wicked, selfish, murderous people on the planet, not just the person next door, but the world over, through every generation. We are wicked to the core. Without restraint, we do all sorts of horrible, horrible things. I just read an article this week, some, some young, young woman, I think around 21 years old, decided one day that SpongeBob told her to chop her six-year-old son's head off, and so she did it. That is how wicked people are. And you know what should happen to her? She should be taken out in the square right now, and her head should be chopped off, instantly. But you know what's going to happen? That case is going to get hung up in the courts for five years. It's going to go through five appeal processes and she's going to end up in prison for probably 20 years. Is that justice? Of course it's not. And the blood of that poor little boy is crying out to God to be avenged and it won't be. And the blood of that little boy will be on not just her mother's hands, but on this nation's hands. And the outcome when violent criminals are not dealt with properly is that, is, is that you end up with a complete immoral, immoral, lost, violent society. And that is exactly where we're headed right now. But listen, when violent criminals are dealt with properly, 
then two wonderful things happen, very wonderful things. It becomes such a deterrent, such a deterrent if you're actually bringing swift justice that you have very few victims in society because you have very few criminals. Do you see how that works? Do you see how it's actually a, a gift of love for God to tell us to bring vengeance upon criminals? Because it deters other criminals from doing the same thing. If we grew up in a society where for murder, capital punishment was mandatory and swift, well, you know, what we, you know who we'd be like? China. That's who we'd be like, who has one of the lowest murder rates in the entire world. And we look at China and we say they're the most wicked place on the planet. They're, they're scoffing and laughing at us for the wicked, violent crime that is in our country. They have one of the lowest murder rates in the world and they have 1.7 billion people and, and murder is almost unheard of. Why? Does anyone know why? Capital punishment is mandatory and swift for murder. Rape is the exact same way. They have almost zero rape in the country. Why? Capital punishment is mandatory and swift. That's why. Now, I'm not saying they haven't committed other crimes, okay? I'm just saying it's a very, very important study Japan, same way. Capital punishment is mandatory. Philippines, mandatory. These are some of the countries that have the lowest murder rates in the world. Mandatory. It works, church. It works because God says it works. And history proves it works. Say what you want, like I said, about how evil, evil China is. At least they have this right. And their godly law, by the way, is mocking our satanic law. If you make the law of the land according to the law of God, it will restrain the criminal. It will. And therefore, there are few victims because you have few perpetrators. That's the whole point. That's, that's how God deals with this. He loves us. He doesn't want violent crime, so he says this is how you deal with it. And this will take care of violent crime. Anything else won't. Anything else won't. And that's the whole point. But where there is bloodshed and where the blood is unavenged, the nation becomes guilty, the whole nation. And God then moves to judge them if it's not dealt with. And this is where it begins to get scary, church, and where you're going to have to just listen and trust the word of God, okay? And you're going to have to deal with this. And trust me, I've wrestled with this, and I, I've had to deal with this myself. When we think of the unavenged blood in our own country, God gives us a principle from Numbers 35, 33. So you shall not pollute the land in which you, in which you are, for blood pollutes the land, and no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed upon it, except by the blood of those who shed it. Did you get that? The land will never be cleansed of their blood guilt until the one who shed the blood violently sheds their own. It's the only way the blood guilt of a land can be repaid. You might say, Pastor John, we can't go around executing people. Can you imagine how many millions of people on the, uh, in America right now would have to be executed? Yep. Yep, I know. And you're right, I can't. But the government should and must. This is what I'm saying. This is heavy and it seems cruel, but it's not. If we want to fix the direction of this country, vengeance, just vengeance, is the main prescription. Changing another law is not, going to, is not going to abdicate us of this blood guilt. It won't. It will not do it. And brothers and sisters, why are there so many millions of people that deserve the death penalty? It's because the government has not upheld their responsibility to hold the law, God's law, in place. If we were still... If capital punishment was the law of the land, swift capital punishment, we wouldn't have nearly the amount of murders we have right now. Rapes, violent crimes, kidnappings, we wouldn't have them. They would have preserved us as a nation. God's law and obeying God's law always has a preserving effect. Always has a preserving effect. So this seems just incredibly overwhelming to think about the amount of people that, according to the scriptures, would have to shed their blood to pay for their sins and atone the sins of this nation. Now, not atone the sins as far as their salvation. I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but atone the blood guilt. But it wouldn't be this way if the government had done this throughout the entire history. We'd have very few people that would have to atone the blood guilt of, the, uh, guilt of this nation. You might say, well, well, we need to show them mercy. 
Brothers and sisters, mercy is shown through the gospel. That's where God's mercy comes in. Murderous justice demands retribution. That's God's design. Whether you like it or not, that's God's design. There is no debate. Remember, this kingdom is not a democracy. We don't get to change the rules of God's kingdom. We either obey them and live and thrive, or we disobey them and we fall into immoral, disgusting decay. Those are our options. And I think you know exactly where we're at right now in this country. Now this brings into focus a huge problem for this country. Country. Why is America in the mess that it's in morally, culturally, criminally? Now we could probably all give a lot of reasons and I'm not saying none of those reasons play a part of that. But I know this, the government's lack of biblical justice is a primary reason that we are in the position we are in. There is unavenged blood on our hands. Blood that has not been properly paid for and listen, never will be. Never will be. And it didn't just start recently. There are centuries of unavenged blood in this country. After we started a bloody war to take God's authority away from England in this country, what did we do next? We went on a slaughter spree across the nation and killed all the Indians, right? There's a whole bunch of unavenged blood there. blood of the slaves, unavenged blood. The countless murders, rapes, violent crimes that take place by the hundreds in our cities every day, by the thousands across the nation every day, unavenged. These crimes go unavenged. Jail, jail does not satisfy the requirement of the retribution for these crimes. Only the sword pays the debt, blood for blood. That's what the scripture teaches, and you might not like it. Brothers and sisters, that's the biblical prescription. Now, I want to say something here, and this is going to probably be where the biggest shock comes into all of us this morning, but we need to understand this because it's important. This all law applies, brothers and sisters, to all murder, not just the ones that, that, that you look at as worse than the other. It applies to all murder. And we have to wrestle with this because it's a tough conclusion. The unavenged blood of what I believe is the most heinous, violent, disgusting blood on the hands of this country is that we are blood guilty to an absolutely, inconceivably, inconceivably infinite extent for the massacring of unborn children in the womb. It blows all the other things I mentioned out of the water. Out of the water. We are blood guilty, like I said, in such an absolutely inconceivable way. Not only are we not avenging the death of those infants, we are actually affirming it and making it legal. And the number of babies slaughtered in abortion vastly outweighs the number of all the rest combined. The ground of the United States is literally blood-soaked and it cries out for retribution against all of those murderers and violent criminals, those who are worthy of death according to the scriptures. You take a life, you give your life. Now I know that seems harsh, but that's the biblical prescription. That's the biblical prescription. Can you imagine abortion taking place in the Old Testament? What would they do to that woman? And drag her outside of the camp and stone her to death right there. And rightfully so. Rightfully so. Brothers and sisters, we live in a crime blood soaked country and they will never be repaid. What do you think God is going to do to that country at one point or another? What do you think his only course of action will be? Judgment. It's his only course of action. It's the only thing left he can do. As a country, we're not going to stand up for God's vengeance and justice. You're all going to be slaughtered by an invading force or something else, just like happened to Israel. Just like happened to Israel. Brothers and sisters, the blood guiltiness of this country is reason enough to believe that I don't think it's reversible. The course of this country I don't believe is reversible. We can get involved in politics all we want. We can change laws all we want, but we cannot undo this. That's why I think judgment is coming, period. It will come to this country. Because of the unavenged blood of the innocent. We have doomed ourselves by this standard of blood guiltness alone as a country. 
This is the same position, by the way. We're really in the, in the same position historically if you look at what happened in Rome. Almost the exact same mirror. They didn't have abortion the way we have it. They just had a baby. They loved their orgies and sex parties so much they would just get pregnant and have a baby and as soon as they had it, they'd sit down on the porch in the sun to die. Same thing. We see what happened to the Roman Empire. But it's not just them. It's literally every country in the history of the world that doesn't uphold this standard or any of God's standards. We're a guilty nation, church, and right now roaming the streets of our nations are millions of people that have blood on their hands. It's not been paid for. It never will be. That includes everyone who's had an abortion, right to a person who's cold-blooded murdered somebody. And I know that seems harsh, but that's the truth. Now listen to me. This is so important. Does the blood of Christ cover any sin, including murder? Absolutely. We need to remember that. It does. It covers the eternal penalty of guilt, yes, but it does not cancel the consequence of sin. This is what I mean. If a murder is committed and that murderer never gets caught, then he gets saved later in life, but it's found out a few years afterwards that he committed a murder through DNA testing. Do you think the government's going to be like, oh, well, he's a Christian now, so... He gets off the hook. No. The murderer, even though we have a twisted form of justice, that murderer will be brought to justice. There are consequences for sin. There are consequences, blood for blood, for the shedding of blood. Now, I understand almost none of these will be repaid by the government, but that does not mean that the consequence should not still stand. The consequence stands. Any of you who before you were saved, did a bunch of really thing, things that you shouldn't have done, and a lot of those things messed up the rest of your life, didn't they? They kind of put things, uh, a, a difficulty in your life that, you, that you're going to have to live with for the rest of your life. Well, that's a consequence of sin. There are real consequences to sin, and it's no different here. No different. There are physical consequences of sin. The blood of Christ saves us eternally, but it doesn't save us from the consequences of our own sin in the physical right now. In the physical right now. I hope you understand the difference. That's why I say you really need to pay attention. I'm not saying it doesn't cover our sin to save us. It does. But it doesn't cover us from the, 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 the uh, justice system, so to speak. Even though ours doesn't work very well. So I'm going to be honest with you. There's no remedy for this blood guilt except one. God's judgment in our country. That's the remedy. It's already started to happen and it will happen. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom this morning. I get it. It's a nice, beautiful, sunshiny day. Everything's wonderful. That's not my point. My point is this, church. Why are we fighting to save something that's doomed? Why are we throwing our, all of our effort into something that is already doomed? That's the whole point here. No, I'm not saying we don't have civil responsibilities. We're going to get to that next week. But it shouldn't be the focus. We need a priority reset. This country is already blood guilty to the point it cannot be reversed there is no way to repay all the millions of people that even at this very moment would have to go under the sword if we held up God's justice. Millions and millions of people, a lot of people you know, maybe even some of you. I know that sounds harsh, but it's not. It's the law of God. It wouldn't take away your salvation or anyone you know salvation. Israel's blood guilt cost them dearly, church, and it's going to cost us very, very dearly as a country. We're trying to save a dying animal with politics and it's not going to work on this principle alone. On this principle alone. This is why, and I know this is a heavy sermon and I get it and I know some of you are dealing with things right now and I've thought about this and I've prayed about this and I've struggled with this all through the night last night. I even woke up at three in the morning. But I must preach the truth of God's word. God's word. We must come to this biblical conclusion. Okay? Because it's going to do something for us when we do. It's going to set us free. And it's going to get us focus on our, our priorities. That's what it's going to do. It's going to get us focus on our priorities. If you think this nation is savable through a democratic process, through laws, through politics, you're wrong. It's already doomed by blood guiltness alone. It's doomed. We are blood guilty. Blood guilty by the millions and millions and millions and untold millions. And it breaks my heart, church. It breaks my heart. And so what are we left with? If that's the case, well, I think it brings us, brings us back full circle to my original point. 
the start of Romans 13. Let's get busy saving souls, church. Let's get busy saving souls because that's kingdom work. And we have to be about kingdom, kingdom work. We can't be about saving a flailing, dying, I'm gonna say this, dead country. Not primarily. We need to be, be busy saving souls because a lot of those souls that are guilty of that blood, they need, the, they need the blood of Jesus Christ to cover them, to save them from their eternal penalty. Not just from murder, but from every lie they've told, from, from every time they've disobeyed their parents, from every time they've fornicated sex out of marriage, from every time they've had a lustful thought, from every time they've literally done anything against God's law, stolen, lied. They need saved from that. And the gospel's the only thing that's gonna do that. Priority reset, church. That's what this is all about. That's what this practical Christian living is all about. Priority reset. Live your life for Christ as a living sacrifice. It encompasses everything. There's nothing that that doesn't touch in our lives. Living sacrifice. I am so grateful this morning that if I described you this morning with the blood guiltness, you can be set free from that penalty eternally through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I say amen and hallelujah to that. But everybody needs that same gospel, church. Everybody needs forgiveness and mercy through Jesus Christ for their souls, whether it's murder or it's a lie. The penalty is the same before God. You break his law, you face his wrath. And so I just encourage you this morning, if you are not in Christ, today is the day of salvation, thus saith the Lord. Cry out to the Lord in repentance. Lord, I have sinned against you, forgive me. And I trust that Jesus Christ has paid my penalty through the cross. He shed his blood so I don't have to shed mine to pay for my sin. If that's you this morning, call out to God. He will hear you. The Bible says a broken heart, a contrite heart, a heart that's humble before him. God will not turn away. He will not despise it. He will heal your brokenness. He will forgive you of your sin and he will grant you everlasting life. That is what we need to be about as a church and as a country, brothers and sisters. That alone right there. And to be honest with you, I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted talking and arguing about politics especially in light of this. What are we trying to save? What? Amen. Brothers and sisters, our mission is kingdom work. And we're gonna talk about kingdom work next week. And I'm gonna answer some of the questions you had next week. I hope this morning some of those questions were answered for you. But if not, we're gonna get into the nitty gritty, so to speak, of what does our civil responsibility look like? But remember, the gospel is the major heading of our life. Everything else is a footnote. Let's pray. Well, thank you so much for listening to this message all the way through, and it was a long one. Um, and a heavy message, I understand that. Uh, difficult, I think, probably, for many people to deal with, even many people in the church who've dealt with uh, some of those things we've talked about. Many people in the church have, have, been, have come to Christ, have been saved, and yet... Uh, they've had an abortion, and and I understand the, the difficulty of, of, of dealing with that, uh, the guilt of that abortion. I want to uh, just let you know and encourage you that uh, I'm in no way saying that you ought to harm yourself to pay for your own blood guiltness or that uh, we as Christians should go around uh, bringing retribution in any way uh, to anybody who's, who's broken that and defiled that, that law of the Lord, blood for blood. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that you understand that there is no, um, there is no call and I'm not advocating uh, self-harm in any way, uh, self-loathing in any way. I want to encourage you that if you are in Christ and you have had an abortion, um, that you don't have to live with the fear of suffering uh, that eternal penalty for your sin against, uh, against God, against mankind, against that child, um, that through the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, we can be forgiven of anything, of anything, including something as heinous as abortion. Just know there, that there are consequences, and obviously as a Christian woman who's had an abortion, uh, one of those consequences is guilt, and I understand that, and, and um, God can bring healing to that guilt, but you're probably going to deal with some guilt for the rest of your life, and that's going to be one consequence of, uh, of, of, of participating uh, in, in that, in having an abortion. 
I want to also encourage you that um, it, as we think about blood guiltness, um, that there, I can't imagine there ever being a time in this country uh, where uh, you will have to pay for that, uh, that blood with your own blood. Uh, I don't think there's a time where the government will, will kind of go back and, and, and retroactively enact a law and the death penalty on anyone who's had an abortion. So I don't think even that's an, an issue you're going to have to worry about. Um, I just want to encourage you that you have been set free through Christ. If you are in Christ, you have been set free from the eternal penalty of that guilt, the eternal penalty of that crime against God and crime against mankind. And I want to encourage you that you can get, to, you can get busy. Get busy getting to work for the gospel. That you, if you've had an abortion, you have a very unique opportunity to minister to other women who have also had an abortion. That you can bring those who are already in Christ comfort, encouragement, uh, knowing that you are forgiven. That you can uh, come to the, to the conclusion and understanding that even though uh, God requires blood for blood, even in that situation, uh, that because our government is not upholding the standard uh, that God has, has put in place, you don't have to fear that. You don't have to fear, live in fear of that. And you can get busy with the gospel. You can get busy setting people free from their, really, their greatest fear. The fear is not losing this life. That shouldn't be our greatest fear. Our fear would be spending an eternity in hell, having to face the wrath of God. The gospel sets us free from that. No matter how heinous of a crime you've committed against God or man, no matter how heinous of a sin. So I want you to be encouraged uh, this day. I know that was a difficult message to hear, especially if you're in that position. But also it is a very encouraging message because you have an opportunity now to, to begin to put your life on the path that leads to truth, that leads other people to truth, and that leads people to repentance and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I just want to encourage you, in no way am I advocating that we harm ourselves or, or take matters into our own hands to pay for that blood guilt. God will judge this nation, and we'll leave that to God. Vengeance ultimately belongs to the Lord. And so we'll leave that vengeance to him. And so just wanted to encourage you in that. And I wanted to uh, say that if you are not in Christ and you've had an abortion, if you're not in Christ, that there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness through the gospel. Jesus Christ died on your behalf. He took the blood. He shed the blood that you deserve to shed for your sins against God. And through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ alone, we can be forgiven. And so be encouraged, I hope. Thank you again so much. Have a blessed day.